some of the key advice that you know one would give to somebody who is thinking about how to better their relationship to their money and also how to build some financial freedom out of it start today yesterday would have been better but today is all we have start with whatever you have and over the time you'll build the habit which would be point number two hi everyone i'm Rhea. and i'm marilyn and you're listening to who run the world a podcast where two best friends talk about different experiences and stories as arab women in the world today and this is a very special spin-off that we started a few months ago called things my mother didn't tell me but my best friend did so we started this spin-off because as we were recording our podcasts and also having offline conversations about our lives, we realized that there were so many topics that our mothers hadn't spoken to us about that we think they should have. And so we started this mini series to explore those topics. And as we did realize how many other women out there wish their mother would have spoken to them about these topics. And today, Razi, we are speaking about something that most Arab women and men usually don't talk about. We are talking about money, 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 money. <laughs> Joining us today is a dear friend of mine. Her name is Doctor, though I never call her that, Christiane Mueck. And she's an accomplished business leader, a founder, a people developer, and culture builder with two decades of experience. She's worked with a diverse range of people from millennials to industry leaders and experts whose goal is to grow their businesses and who want to continue developing themselves. She has a PhD in education economics, but the reason she is here today is that she co founded and is the managing director of Into financial coaching whose goal is to tackle financial well-being with a fresh approach focused on managing mindsets and behaviors and into financial helps people get an empowered understanding of modern personal finances and financial independence i really love financial well-being i don't think i've ever heard that before financial well-being it's basically what we are all striving for when we started thinking about this topic we were really struck by how uncomfortable we were with our own money with the money of people around us in the cultures where i've been socialized uh, in europe and germany you don't talk about money the places where i've lived for most of my life in the middle east uh, you also don't really talk about money you might show your money but then you hide your debt <laughs> When it comes to financial well-being, the money is something in the back of your mind that you're never really comfortable with, that you always have this feeling where you should know more about it, you should do more about it. For most people, it's just not a topic you're comfortable with. As we've gone from physical well-being to mental well-being, maybe now it's a time for financial well-being. And you started this company to help with financial literacy, so to help change people's education, but also their mindset around money, right? Yes, I wouldn't necessarily say it's a Corona project. It's been something that's been brewing for a while, but we have started it as an initiative and then later as a company last year, summer. What we really noticed are a few things. One is there is, as always, there's tons of content out there, right? Whether you want to buy your first house or your first car or your first stock or your first ETF or your first cryptocurrency. There's a ton of content. There is YouTube newsletters, academic courses. Yet, it's not something that calls you to action. The other thing is anything financial investment, trading um, has become much easier over the last years. It's become uh, you know something that you can do on your smartphone. There's uh, many, many, many apps that uh, help you to buy and sell And uh, the costs have gone down uh, a lot as well. In the past, you had order fees of uh, 10, 20, 30, 50 euros or dollars. And now you're paying something like 1% or less. Everything has become more accessible. Yet, most of the world, especially in, in Europe, is not really invested directly in the stock market. So we came in from a very different perspective. We said, well, we are not the financial experts, at least not yet. We are not the people who can describe every single idea about uh, cryptocurrency in big detail, but we all come from an education and coaching background. So we know how people learn. We know how people um, learn new things, how they stick with them. This is what we try to apply to the topic of investing and uh, financial freedom. And so while you learn a lot when you work with us, 
you also do a lot and uh, change behavior. What do you think are some of the ingrained behaviors that create a negative relationship to investing your money? I think the, the most important thing is that you have very few forums uh, to talk about money. That starts in your family. I have uh, so many friends who don't talk about money with their spouses in great detail that, uh, you know, run around with uh, hidden debt and uh, spending on stuff that uh, no one should know about. The same thing applies to, uh, you know, your parents, your siblings, your friends, depending on culture. But, you know, we've, we've worked with people from nearly all around the world by now. And like money is never a comfortable topic. I echo that from my personal experience. It was like, hella painful to get my husband to talk to me about his finances even though there was nothing to hide really but it was just conceptually so difficult to even have that conversation not to mention with parents or members of our family i don't know Rhea, have you ever had conversations with your family about money it was interesting my parents displayed a very good example in the sense that even though my dad worked and my mom didn't they had very open discussions about their finances together in front of us but then when it came to their children they'd be like oh you don't don't worry i think it's great for a five six seven eight ten fifteen year old not to worry about money i think it gives a sense of security as a child and then the main golden rule that they would tell us would be just save your money and there was never this talk of investment and then i had a father who is very cautious and then a mother who wanted to be a bit more take more risks. That was the example that we had is a couple that would talk about it. They would talk about it with us. But then it was, this doesn't leave the house. Mm. Like this stays here. So when I started working, even sharing what my salary was, even kind of asking what to do with the money that I did save, that was always a, a taboo. I felt scared. And also there was a lot of fear in not having the information and asking dumb questions. For the longest time, I thought, oh, all I need to do is save and then I'm good for life. But then it turns out that that's not necessarily true. That's a super nice example, Rhea, because it's a great example of, you know, how as adults, you can talk to your children about money in a way that doesn't scare them. And I think uh, a lot of people just have experiences where, you know, money is always this topic that's lingering in the background. That's never really addressed by the fact that it is not addressed. It becomes something secret, something hidden, something bad. Then you uh, want to stop uh, asking questions about it, whether you're, you know, a young child or an adult child. <laughs> and it becomes better over time, right? Like once you get used to it, it's not that you talk about money all the time, but you become better at asking good questions. You become better at volunteering information and uh, then you get better answers typically. Yeah, that's a really great point. I mean, my experience with my single mom was that when I was a kid, sometimes my mother would do something, which I now know to be that she used to do it on purpose. I just didn't know that when I was a kid, was that some months I would ask for something like a game, shoes, whatever it was that I wanted. And her answer that month would be, this month, we don't have it in our budget that we can spend on extra items. And while I think my mother should have even for herself, actually, not just for me, spent more time thinking about how to grow money and how to invest it on the side of spending it, which is a different kind of perspective. I think that really taught me to live with zero dollars or $20,000, like no problem. And in that sense, I think has helped me kind of see money as a flow of things like it, I don't need to own it. So the pandemic was the first time in my adult life that I started investing. I don't have any like emotional relationship to the money in that account. I already don't own it anyways. Goes up, goes down. Like I go and I'm like, oh, I won this week. And then I forget about it. It's like fictional points, really. And I think that was for me a good place to start with my relationship with money, which is that I never felt like I needed it to be safe or secure. I love that emotional relationship to money. I think that's such a good point of finding that balance of knowing the importance of money and the value of a dollar, but at the same time, not directly linking it to your happiness. I made my first put a little bit of investment this week. So this is very exciting. Congratulations. Was it in preparation for the episode? No, it was actually, I'll tell you the story. As I'm growing more comfortable in talking about my finances, and I think also the crisis in Lebanon was a big proponent of that, of so many people having just saved and saved and put their money in their savings and then that being gone so quickly. 
I just kept thinking, I was like, I don't want that to happen to me one day. So having more open conversations and saying, okay, Rhea, you don't know the information. You have a lot of very smart people around you who work in finance, who work in crypto, who work in all these different segments. Start asking questions, open the conversation, see what other people are doing. What have they tried? What has worked for them? What are you comfortable with? Over brunch last week, we started having a very honest conversation on the table about the state of our finances, what we wanted for ourselves, what was smart, what different people did, what worked for them, what didn't work for them. And I think that was such a wonderful conversation. And Marilyn, I know you, me and Hadi have, have had those conversations as well. So my mother and father taught me how to not have an emotional relationship with money, but also understand the value of a dollar. But then my friends taught me how to make smart decisions with your money. Uh, and then Lebanon taught me that it can go in a second. So <laughs> thank you, Beirut. <laughs> thank you, Beirut. <laughs> and honestly, uh, one thing that uh, I'm, I'm fascinated by is that you both said it's good to not have an emotional relationship with your money. And I challenge you on that because uh, most people, when they say that, it's really more something that they want to keep in neutral and that they maybe want to avoid a little bit. The smile on your face when you just said you did your first investment this week. Um, you know, I mean, this is also <laughs> a source of pride. This is something about taking your life into your own hands. That's true. Whether you're looking at the Corona stock market crash last year or the stock market crash in 2008-9 or you were invested in Lebanon, you know, pick any of those. Having the ability to take care of this on your own and to, you know, get a little bit less dependent on, you know, what your parents told you, what your banker tells you, what your app and your friends tell you. Everyone who could have really predicted the future last year in summer could have made a lot of money. Guess what? Most people stole their stocks and all their investments at the lowest point. But see, here is something that I've learned about investing, having been doing that for the last year. It is actually not rocket science. Yes. That's Thank what you. I've learned. Actually, <laughs> everybody could have predicted the future in the case of an economic crash, because unless the world suddenly melts tomorrow and we're hit by an asteroid and we all disappear off the face of the fucking earth, guess what's going to happen? The market's going to go back up. Before I started seeing how my money was moving, I had this sense that you had to be like highly educated about the markets, that you had to like know the ins and outs of every fucking company, read their PNL, you know, all of that complex shit, look at their balance sheets. Actually, it turns out, Without wanting, you know, I'm no doctor, aka I'm no financial advisor. So please don't listen to my advice. Call your financial advisor. But honest to God, you could pretty much invest in probably anything, save for like the 3% of companies that are like crashing and make money if you're just patient about it. I would agree with especially the first part of this. If you have a well diversified portfolio, which means you have probably something, either a vehicle, a fund, an ETF, something like that, that has more than 25 stocks in it, or you have a, an own portfolio that has more than 25 stocks in it, and you just buy that and sit on it for the next 10 years. Historically, you've always made money and you've made a, more, a lot more money by you know shifting it around, moving it around a lot. I think that's the thing that requires zero skill. Other than patience and sitting on your hands and whatever happens, don't sell. Maybe invest more, buy more and watch your portfolio grow. That's essentially it. Buy a diversified portfolio and forget it exists and come back and see it in however long, five, 10 years, and it'll have grown. And literally you got nothing else to do. And that's the thing that I didn't realize. I used to think that you had to be picky about which companies. And by the way, I didn't even buy what I would call like a traditionally diversified portfolio. Like I actually picked the stocks that I was going to buy. And you know how I picked them? They're just brands that I like. And you know how my friend Laurence picks them? She has diabetes and she picks companies that produce products that help people with diabetes. It's just buy what you understand and what you think has value in this world. And I buy the stocks of the clients who hire us. It's a hidden compliment to myself. I'm like, well, you must be really <laughs> smart if you're hiring me. Um, so I shall buy your stock. And by the way, guess what? Every single one of those has gone up for me in the last year or year and a half, however long it's been. I'm just buying things I understand, buying companies that I respect. People have this envy of 
of like the day traders or the people who suddenly make this really smart move and they get a 30% upside. For sure, there's a bit of that FOMO. I don't have much of it because ain't nobody got time for that, but I understand that it exists. But for the average human being who doesn't have time to be worrying about these things, that's really all you need to do. There is something uh, very, very true about this, which is no one can beat the market. You know, there there have been movies about this and, and articles and so on about these people who beat the stock market in the real estate crash in 2008, 2009. There have been people who got incredibly rich uh, last year uh, by investing at the right point, by investing in crypto, blah, blah, blah. It's not sustainable. You may be able to beat the market two or three years in a row. Other than that, the stock market over the last 50 years has grown uh, something between 7 and 9% every year. Don't even try to beat it. If you can do that by literally sitting on your hands, <laughs> that's pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, I, I do that. I go and I look back at how much money we've made and I'm like, literally, I did nothing. And I think another thing that I learned this year is that companies and trends that do good are going to do good for a while. And what do I mean by that? You might be sitting here thinking, I missed the Bitcoin wave. You didn't. I remember I looked at, I think it was Moderna about a year ago. I'm like, oh, it's already gone up too much. Like, forget it. I was trying to be smart instead of just buying into a concept or a company that I understood. And then guess what? Went up again. And I was like, Mm -hmm. you fucking idiot. And the thing is, of course, there's always these like... um, rush to gold, but outside of the rush to gold, outside of when Elon Musk tells everybody to invest in something, if you think something is good, the time it takes for it to stop climbing is so long that you can go for it. But I think one of the challenges for people is that when people talk about these things, they won't say, oh, I just bought stock in Spotify and I don't know what's going to happen. I'm going to sit on my hands and wait. What they'll do is they probably bought stock in Spotify, let's say four years ago. You didn't see this four years of waiting. They won't mention that. They're only going to brag about their smart choices after the stock has gone up and they've seen a return on their investment. So people will, won't talk about that. Hey, just just wait and be patient and buckle <laughs> down and the trust in the market. Like people will never say that because it's just not sexy to say. All this advice that you guys just gave just makes it seem so much more approachable. And I guess the most important thing is patience, which I guess a lot of people are uncomfortable with. Is that what you're finding, Christian, is that people are uncomfortable with the patience? Absolutely. You could probably talk for like two hours about biases when we're talking about investing, right? Now I'm dating myself, but like if you grew up in the 80s and you watch Wall Street, you're confronted with stuff like greed is good and like, you know, the stock went up 30% today and now I'm buying my new Ferrari, you know, based on that one smart choice. Well, I mean, good for you, right? But the point is the average investor will never be able to make these decisions And they're really much more interested in long-term stable investment. Now, how did you do that in the past? In the past, you went to uh, your bank, you bought some kind of uh, government bond or another bond, and you knew you would get 7, 8, 12% for the next 10 years. So those times are over because interest rates are too low. Now, what do you do today? What did our parents do if they could afford it? They bought one house. With a 30 or 40 year mortgage, that was then very often the only investment they could afford because that mortgage was so crippling for most of their professional life that this was the only thing they could really invest in, which is good. So they now have a house when they retired. Congrats. For most of uh, our generation, it is not so clear cut anymore. There are many different things you can invest in. You can buy a house or an apartment. You can buy crypto. You can buy stocks. You can do that uh, on your own. You can do that through an uh, through a broker. You can invest in companies. You can build your own business, like I think we're all are doing. It's not one this one size fits all anymore. And that also changes your relationship to money. I was speaking with a friend the other week, and he basically said, look, for our parents, it was like a, a P&L game money coming in, money going out. Today, you need to be asset managing. And then, you know, you you might have a lot of people who say, well, I don't have any assets. But, you know, for a lot of people, that is really not true. Or they could have assets, but they chose to buy that new car or that new TV or the new PlayStation because they buy a new PlayStation every one and a half years when a new one comes out. It's about smart decision making. It's about uh, having this long-term focus 
you know, I also don't think it's uh, it's by chance that we have uh, three women on this podcast here because I think women are actually often better at this. We are. Well, look at yourself. I mean, I hate to be sexist here, but I would have thought. <laughs> Since we're on a sexist topic, Christian, are women more risk averse? Well, I I wouldn't want to generalize, <laughs> but that's a, that's a cop out. <laughs> Come um, on. I mean, I'm saying this and, and I know that if you look it up right now, you will see that on average, women are considered to be more risk averse. Although yeah. the way that one measures risk is very male focused. So I've actually not for this podcast, but a while back, I gave a, a little talk to um, a community of like women in finance. And I remember doing a bit of the homework. And yes, women on average are rated as being more risk averse. But actually, it's because the scale is very skewed towards what men perceive as risk taking, not adjusted for gender differences. But on the whole, like, we can say that less women are probably actively investing in the stock market. Can we not? Uh, that's probably true, but also the majority of most populations, maybe the US is an exception there, but the majority of most populations are not really invested in stock markets uh, directly. The, the question is, what do you mean by risk taking? You know, you could say it's smart and it makes sense from a risk point of view to sit on your hands and do nothing during a crash. If you define it risk-taking, going to an extreme and trading very short-term earnings potential or profit potential with a super high risk, yeah, that's risk-taking. But that's also, you know, the, the border to gambling <laughs> is very, very thin. That's a really so great point. We should all take risks, but we should also all take smart risks probably off topic, but if you look at uh, female-led companies, big or small, they're often more stable. They might not be the ones that turn into a unicorn within three years. Maybe that's something to, to look at, but they're, they're much often more stable, uh, better returns, better environmental records, and, and so on and so on. And the same, I would say, is, is true for investing, because you said this uh, earlier, Marilyn, you just don't have time to spend your whole day uh, looking at the stock chart of uh, Bitcoin and uh, trade and sell and trade and sell, then you just trust that within the next five years, the value of Bitcoin is going up, for example, or some other stock that you bought. Just a question for Rezi on the risk side. So you said you started investing this week. What did you invest in? You talked about yourself and Laurence and how you choose the different companies you invest in. So I went in thinking, I don't know anything about this. I don't have time to check what's going up and down. In the option on the app that I used, it's called Nutmeg. Their team chooses it for you and then you just set your risk level. So it's on a zero to 10. They also ask you, what's your goal? Do you want to buy a house in X amount of years or do you want to just put this in and not look at it? I put my risk level at a five. Oh, that's not that low. It's not so bad. It's in the middle. I, I knew that this was a bunch of money that I was going to put in and I was going to forget about it. Like I, I'm putting this in and I'm not even looking at it. And then I also put in that every month I would automatically add to that pot. So every month I'm adding an extra, I think I put 150 pounds or something like that. This is a good app because in the UK there are rules and taxes and things like that. This also makes sure that you're within the law and that you can invest up to 20,000 pounds without it being taxable. Also... I was going to put more money, but then I decided to take some of that and then invest into crypto. So I got another app called Coinbase and then I'm waiting to be approved. And once I'm approved, I'm going to start investing into Coinbase because I don't remember who told me, but they said that you need to diversify your investments and not put everything in one place. And I'm thinking also now after this conversation, I work in content. I love the streaming wars. Go. I want to get into it. So Netflix, Disney, here I come. I love that approach, honestly, because once you've done all of these, so you'll have a diversified portfolio, right? If you buy all these content apps and a little bit of crypto and uh, you keep your five squared investment, whatever it is, that's basically perfect. That's actually where we as a company are trying to get people towards because you have a lot of people out there that actually have disposable income for investing, yet downloading this app going through the process, choosing the first stock, blah, 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 blah. It's all a bit scary 
typically, uh, if you don't have people around you who tell you, oh, yeah, I've used the same app. It's good. I've been using it for a year or two. You know, they don't go bankrupt. Your money is not all gone. You know, where are you going to get your re this reassurance from? In the past, you had your banker who you went to and had a cup of coffee with. And that model is, is definitely dying out. So you need to get that reassurance from somewhere else. And that's kind of what you guys help people with. I have a question. You guys always talk about financial freedom. What do you see as financial freedom? You're financially free when you can keep your current standard of living or whatever your desired standard of living is without having to trade time for money. Now, that's never really the case, right? Because you also will have to look at your portfolio every now and then. You need to make sell and buy decisions and so on. But that's the idea. It's a dream and it might actually remain a dream for most people. But at the same time, you know, it's actually the state that our parents would have told you is retirement. I think that's probably just a thing that will not happen for most of us anymore because Nearly all the retirement systems in the world are broken, while you might get, I think in Germany, it's something around 50% of your last income guaranteed. How the hell should I know what my income is at age 65 when I'm supposed to retire? That's a big gamble. I don't know what I'll do until then. Maybe I want to retire much earlier than this, or I want to keep working after that, right? And in principle, the philosophy behind financial freedom is that you have a much bigger choice in determining when this happens. Right, as opposed to waiting it out until you're 64. Yeah, and then you figure out that, oh, basically I need to move out of my apartment and I can't go on vacation anymore. And, you know, I'll be able to shop for food, but that's basically it. And again, people start from very different starting points, right? So some people that... <laughs> That, that come to us, they come because they have recently made an inheritance. There's something really emotional attached with that. Some people come because, you know, they've been earning really well and they've gotten their bonuses every year and they've just stashed them away in some account where they get 0.1% interest. And they know that that's not a good thing, but, you know, that's how it is. And then you have people who uh, come and say, well, basically I'm really tight on money i have nothing to invest but you know after a while you find out that you know maybe those 50 100 150 euros pounds dollars a month you can still make that happen and that again compounded over the next 20 to 30 years if you do that every month you know it will not buy you the ferrari but it will maybe buy you that one additional week of vacation every year or, you know, just a little bump in your lifestyle. So financial freedom, it's not clear how many people will achieve that uh, just with their own uh, work, but uh, you're much more likely to achieve it if you invest on top of just uh, earning your income. This all sounds very reassuring, I have to tell you. Rhea. How are you feeling about your investment after this conversation? I'm so excited. And do you think you'll be good at waiting uh, five years before touching your money? Yeah, I know so. Unless some disaster happens in my life, I think I will be good at just not looking at it. Because when you save and you keep things in your bank account and you just have that discipline of removing a little bit from my salary each month, I think it's the similar discipline here of just not looking at it and forgetting about it. Also, I'm a very forgetful person. <laughs> Let somebody know about your investment just in case, you know. <laughs> I just told you. <laughs> we just told the public. So to recap some of the key advice that, you know, one would give to somebody who is thinking about how to better their relationship to their money and also how to build some financial freedom out of it. What's your top five, Christian? Give us the five steps of where to start. Uh, top five. Okay. Start today. Great advice. I love that. Yesterday would have been better, but today is all we have. Don't think of starting, you know, I know it's middle of November. Don't think of starting in January because that's when you just got your bonus and you have some money. The point is to invest $500 or $1,000. It's much easier to handle than if you suddenly have $50,000. Your brain will melt 
when you think of having to invest 50,000 of anything. And it's much more difficult than buying a car. So start today, start with whatever you have. And over the time, you'll build the habit, which would be point number two. Set a habit, optimize as much as you can there, put away these, whatever the mon- amount is every month. And be like Rhea, forget about it for the next five years. <laughs> <laughs> but tell someone about that's it. The, that's the third thing. Um, find someone to talk about this with. Because one is you'll probably get some ideas. You'll definitely also get lots of opinions. You know, uh, try to distinguish the, the information from the opinion. A lot of people will tell you about the hot stocks, the not so hot stocks, the things you should be aware of, the thing that is definitely going to happen in a week from now and then never happens and so on. But start talking with people and make decisions on that. Uh, The fourth one, I think we're at the fourth, is try to start creating accountability. If that's a coffee with your with your best friend every month saying, you know, did you did you do your saving? Did you do your investing? What is the new thing you're thinking about? You're planning for a house. Last month, it was 10 years away. Now it's nine years and 11 months away. What are you doing about it? That is very, very helpful to nudge each other, to keep each other accountable. And we're doing this with bigger groups. It works really, really well, but you can also just really do this with one or two other people. And the last thing is, and I think COVID has taught us time and again, we suck at understanding exponential growth. We do not understand that if we invest today $10,000 and we just let it lie there for 10 years, we'll have something more than $20,000 in 10 years without ever touching it. You don't need to make any other decision. You just keep it there. You get it compounded with your interest at, at 8% like we had for the last 20 or 30 years. And this is something... If you think about this in detail, your brain melts. You understand the math, but you don't understand how your money doubles within 10 years without you doing anything. And so this is something, uh, again, check yourself, calculate, set targets, and so on. Reap the benefits from that, and you should be fine. Everything you've described sounds relatively easy and quite reassuring. That's what I discovered this year investing too, is it's not that hard and it just works. As long as you're not trying to outsmart everybody else or the market, well, I'll add a six and seven on my side. Six, sign up to Intu's newsletter. Uh, we'll uh, put that link in the show notes. Christiane has been very shy to promote her platform, but we shall do it for her. And a piece of advice that I got from my husband is that Whatever you think is the riskiest bet that you're making. So let's say you think that crypto is the riskiest bet that you're making. Then what he advised me and I think is really useful is that outside of like your ongoing like quote unquote safe bets, dedicate as much as you would have spent on one dinner out. You won't miss that money. And I think that's just very practical, tangible, down to earth advice and it works because it's not money that you might have spent on something meaningful. I mean, a dinner is important, but if you're lucky, you have many of those per month. And so just skipping one of them and spending that on your riskiest bet, if it goes away, you won't miss it. You have uh, an eight, nine, and 10 reel? As someone who feels like they don't know anything or is very intimidated by the knowledge we think that we need to acquire to start investing, don't be scared and don't be afraid to ask questions. There's no such thing as a dumb question. As with many other topics, if you're just starting out, it might be a little bit awkward to talk about, but it becomes really an interesting conversation. It tells you so much about how another person thinks, not about money only, but also how they see life and how they make decisions. It's also an opportunity to get to know your friends, your partner, your parents uh, better by having, having these types of discussions. And so I think that is on a completely non-financial level. That's a, that's a beautiful thing. What you said is really nice. And I know we didn't talk a lot about like the philosophy of money, but I think that in that sense, how you choose to spend your money and your relationship to it says a lot about your philosophy of life, how you exchange value, your relationship to abundance or scarcity. Like it says so much about your view of the world and your fears and your primal reactions to things and it's such a great vector for discovering a lot about each other on this lovely note 
Dear listeners, Christian, Rhea, thank you so much for this conversation. I hope that you guys enjoyed it and learned as much as we did. I hope that this motivates you to start building your financial freedom and to start investing. Christian, thank you so much for taking the time to come and talk to us about this and share the wisdom that you've acquired uh, through supporting others on their own financial freedom journey. We'll put the links to your organization in our show notes for those who want to learn more about it. Speaking of money, you can do a lot of things with it, including two things. As always, if you are Lebanese or attached to Lebanon in any way and you have some money to spare, maybe not as much as you'd put in the stock market, but maybe 10% of that or five, you can donate it uh, to one of the organizations that we'll put in the show notes. It is also Diabetes Month. Uh, It so happens. And so if someone you love is impacted by diabetes, consider donating to research in that area. And also don't donate your money, but do donate some of your time if you can to leave us a review and let us know if you enjoyed this episode. And that's it from moi. Rhea, any famous last words? Mm. no all right Rhea's already thinking about her next investment move we'll do a follow-up episode in the same <laughs> yes i would be like listen my money didn't double after you start investing if you don't already find us on instagram and follow us on who around the world pod or send us an email about any topic you'd like us to cover in the future on say hi at who around the world podcast.com uh, we wish you all a wonderful and abundant day and we look forward to our next episode